Well, if we haven't met, my name is Pastor Jim. I'm the community and family life pastor here at Fulton Church. And for the next couple months, we're going to work through the book of James. And um, our theme, as you heard and as you see, is faith works. Our theme is an intentional play on words. In one sense, you can say faith works. In other words, faith is functional. It achieves the purpose for which it is intended. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Your faith has made you well. It's a common phrase from Jesus. And the negative from Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith works. In another sense, you can say faith works or faith labors. Faith acts in cooperation with God. Faith cannot remain idle. Paul quoted from the Old Testament, the righteous will live by faith. James tells us in chapter 2, faith without works is dead. Faith works. Both ways of looking at our theme are key to understanding the book of James. So let's begin with James, brother, servant. Chapter 1, verse 1, and then we'll set the stage. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin today by unpacking the word servants a little bit. Some of the most overwhelming and breathtaking qualities that the Bible teaches us about God are in one sense his grandeur, the immensity of God. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He created and governs the universe. He set in course every star, every moon, and every planet. If you have never been, you should visit a planetarium. It's sensational. It's, it's, it's better than the latest Star Wars trilogy. That was a joke. Okay, I'm sorry. Seats are positioned back in a circular pattern. You look up into the dome ceiling and they take you through the, through the universe. From the infinite to the infinitesimal, from the vastness of the universe to the micro level of the atom, the grandeur of God. And he governs it all. Since we're uh, talking about God's grandeur, we have, there's a picture I want to show you, uh, a picture that was taken uh, of part of God's mystery just recently, April 10th, actually. So I do a shout out to Kate Bowman. Can you put that up, please, guys? And uh, here she is, postdoctoral student at, um, at Harvard who helped develop the code to, to, that took a picture of the black hole. And this is a picture of her, right, when she first saw it for the first time on her computer screen. She's so happy there. Look what I did here. Um, with all this in mind, The wonder of God's grandeur, the immensity. The Bible teaches that God takes special interest in you and me. Jesus said, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Well, someone might say, well, big deal. I'm worth more than a few sparrows, right? Doesn't sound like much. So what? But when Jesus speaks of the hairs on our head and how he forgets not the sparrows, he's emphasizing the worth of those he created in his image. He's speaking of how God cherishes people, that we are intimately known by God, that we are infinitely valuable to him. You see, in the midst of God's grandeur, he's dialed in on us. Psalm 139 says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God gives humanity infinite worth. The Bible tells us that people are created in God's image. Genesis 1.17 So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God in his grandeur transcends all. He created and established all things. Therefore, he gives meaning to all things. He is sovereign over all and is himself infinitely worthy. Created in God's image, God shares with humanity his infinite worth. 
Every life matters to God. God has shaped your days and knows the hairs on your head. You are infinitely valuable to him. Let that sink in a little bit. Just for the moment, focus on you. God knows you individually. To add to his omnipotence and his omniscience, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present at one time. And he desires for us to enjoy the life he gives. Life in his presence. Psalm 1611 says, You have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what is this full life all about? At one time or another, you probably heard someone say, or even felt yourself, that God takes the fun out of life. As if Christians are resentful of their faith and begrudgingly following after him. And it reminds me of a piece from Lord of the Rings where, Rod- or where um, Bilbo wants to hoard the ring to himself. And Gandalf is just trying to get it from him so he might enjoy his life a little bit. God is not a conjurer of cheap tricks. He's not trying to rob us of fun. He's trying to help us experience the best life possible by his commands. Atheism is attractive and seduces people because, as Ravi Zacharias says, it has the the appearances of a world without boundaries. It has the scaffolding of which you can plant any kind of structure you want only to find out that it doesn't hold for the most important questions of your life. God desires that we know the deepest aspects of life. He wants us to have life abundantly. God is not the enemy of life. God is the author of life. He has given his all to lead us on the path to the fullest life possible. How does God lead us into a rich, full and meaningful life? Well, first and foremost, by revealing himself to us. We behold the glory of God. The Bible is all about who God is. We need to learn to see him for who he is in his grandeur. We serve a big God. Secondly, by doing what he says. His commands call us in to see how faith works. The do's and don'ts, the shalts and the shall nots, which are not, by the way, about making our lives miserable. How is God glorified if his commands are all about guilt and shame? As if God is just shaking his head and pointing his finger to shame us, how does that give him glory? He is there to help us. Just yesterday I was visiting my family for, uh, for Easter. My nephew brought this, uh, have you seen those hoverboards? Flat piece, wheels on two sides. I'm thinking, hey, I can take this thing on. I can do it. So I get up on the hoverboard and I get around the room one time, trying to go faster. My kids are like, come on, Dad, thing goes faster than that. Get it going. And I couldn't. My calves are so tight because I'm trying to make it work and I'm leaning forward, but I'm feeling like I'm going to fall when <laughs> I'm leaning forward. So I'm getting, now I'm picking up speed, doing really well. I come around the corner and I go to step off and the thing goes out from underneath me. And I'm flat on my back. <laughs> and my brother, he's right there and reaching down. My, my, all my nieces have it on tape. They, they show me the video. I'm like, oh, it looks really good. But you see, my brother, that's what God does. When we fall, when we stumble, God isn't there to shame us. He might be disappointed. He might be displeased with what we were a part of. But he's there to help us up. He's reaching down to take our hand. I got it on video later if you want to watch. God leads us on to joy. The book of James is going to demonstrate the glory of God, his grandeur, and at the same time, lead us in the details, the do's and don'ts of finding joy. Is going to show us God's glory and might, and at the same time, we hear God saying by his commands, he says, this way to joy, this way to depth, this way to meaning, this way to peace. Let's look at where we're headed and get some background. James is profoundly practical. He is deeply interested in the lordship of Christ in our everyday life. James is not so much a teaching about Jesus 
as it is the teachings of Jesus applied in situations. Maybe you received the handout that Pastor Bob sent out in the email this week, and you can see verses in James parallel to verses in Matthew and how James is takes right from Jesus' teaching. In the letter of James, we are made aware that God's word has been given to us, not that our knowledge might increase, but that our lives might be changed. God's word has been given to us, not that our knowledge might increase, but that our lives might be changed. The emphasis in the letter is not so much about becoming Christians as it is behaving as Christians. Those of us who profess to be followers of Jesus must face up to the challenges. And if you read ahead in the book of James, you'll see there are a lot of challenges. Over half of the 108 verses in James are imperatives, expressing a command. Verse 19, listen up. Verse 26, shut up. Verse 2, 1, don't show favoritism. James wants to get in our business and challenge us how we live. One person said of James, it's a beautifully crafted punch in the gut for those who want to follow Jesus. James offers true wisdom and false wisdom. I'm going to park it there just for a minute because I want to share with you some false wisdom this morning. Maybe you've heard these. I'm sure you have. What doesn't kill you only makes you stronger, except when it severely weakens you. There are times we go through the fire and come out on the other side with more maturity, resolve, and wisdom, but that's not always the case. The statement has a way of burying unhealed wounds and minimizing painful experiences that need to be flushed out. Sometimes they never fully heal or take a lifetime to heal. Deep hurts can breed unhealthy and self-perception behavior and relationships. This makes a person weaker, not stronger. Here's another one. God never gives you more than you can handle. You heard that one? Someone tell you that? This is a well-meaning bit of encouragement, for sure, to someone going through a tough time, but it's misquoted scripture. The verse referenced here speaks specifically to resisting temptation. There are people all over the world confronted with situations and atrocities that are far too much for anyone to handle. God may allow it for a number of reasons, but his main desire is to be intimate with us. He wants us to be dependent on him like a parent and a child. If we could handle everything ourselves, we wouldn't need him. I would also argue that when we handle it our our way, we tend to make a mess. Here's one more for you. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. No, you can't. I will never play in the NBA, no matter how hard I work at it. The problem here is saying, um, this problem with this saying is that it gives a false promise. Applying to your mind, applying your mind to something, excuse me, doesn't mean that you can reach any level of success. There are lots of factors that play into it. We all have different gifts, abilities, and talents. This certainly doesn't mean we discourage our kids from going after lofty goals, right? But we need to help them identify their strengths. Then teach them how to refine those strengths. A more truthful statement might be, if you put your mind to it, you will accomplish excellence. It might work a little better. Moving on to chapter 3, James tells us that teachers will be judged more strictly. And then right in the next verse, he says, uh, you might find a little bit of encouragement there. He says, we're all in this together. Chapter 3, verse 2, we all stumble. We all stumble through our Christian walk. We might not be the fastest runners, we might not all be hitting for the fences, right? We may, not be the, we, may, we may only be making a swing every now and then. It is baseball season, right? i got to bring out some baseball examples. We're all in the stumbling group. James is God's word to stumblers, challenging us to live lives, challenging us to live what we profess. James is about faith on display. Pastor Alistair Begg says this, You see, whenever faith does an issue in love, whenever doctrine, however orthodox, is unrelated to the living of life, 
Whenever we're tempted to settle down for a, a kind of self-centered Christian experience that ignores the social and material needs of other people, or whenever, we can, our, whenever our conduct doesn't match the creed that we declare, then these five chapters have something to say to us that we disregard at our own peril. My mom loves musicals. You guys watch musicals? Whenever, when I was younger, I can remember being in conversation with her and she would just break into a song, something from some old musical, right? Have you seen My Fair Lady? Well, Mark Matthews just saw it yesterday. He told me <laughs> he was sitting right over here. When Eliza sings to Freddie, do you remember? Anybody remember? What does she sing? She says, sing me no song, read me no rhyme, don't waste my time, show me. Don't give me lip service. Show me by your actions. This is what James is expressing. Faith on display. As God's truth in James take root in our lives, then there will be a visible impact at Fulton Church. There'll have to be. Our doctrine must be on display. Our faith ought to function in a way that it is unavoidable to miss. James isn't a tour of the health club, walking around looking at all the new latest exercise equipment. James is an invitation to get on the equipment and use it. Faith works. And after a period of time, people should be able to come in with measuring tapes and see a difference. The result is doers of the word. A bit of history. James is likely the earliest book written in the New Testament, and we're going to walk through it a little backwards. James says he is writing to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. There's some clues we can look at in Scripture to help us recognize who he's speaking to when he's talking about 12 tribes. First Peter has a similar opening line. He says, to God's elect scattered throughout the world. When we look back to the Old Testament, with the fall of the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes of Israel were lost in the northern kingdom. The reconstitution of the 12 tribes was now seen through the lens of the messianic hope. The church, in the universal view of the New Testament, are the people of God, the successors to Judaism. Therefore, it's likely James has in mind the multiracial church here. James is writing, as, as Peter did, to the church scattered throughout the world. James was half-brother to Jesus. The Bible tells us he didn't always believe. The Apostle John wrote about Jesus, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. All kinds of people were going to Jesus for healing and for teaching, but those in his own household thought he was nuts. That's kind of how it is in families, right? But something changes in James. Something changes. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote that Jesus appeared to James. When we get to Acts chapter 15, James is at the heart of the Council of Jerusalem. Here, the church was hammering out relationships between Jews and Gentiles. And James is right in the middle of it all, calling for Christian unity. After naming himself, James goes on to identify who he is in his inmost being. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting how another family member, Jude, has a similar opening line in his book, in his letter in the New Testament. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. Here James is acknowledging the plurality of the Godhead, right? He is a servant of God and the Lord. Well, the word Lord in the Greek is taken from the Hebrew, Yahweh. So he's calling Jesus Lord, he's calling him God. Jesus, his name Joshua, or God as Savior, the meaning of his name. And Christ, the Messiah, the promised Savior to come. Jesus, or sorry, James, servant of God, servant, Messiah. James had a transformation. He came to realize the wonder of his relationship with Jesus did not lie in the fact that they shared the same birth mother, but the miracle of God's goodness to him. That God opened his eyes to understand that Jesus was a person he declared himself to be. Jesus is, or James is an example of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.16, where it says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, 
we do so no longer. Paul is talking about the miracle that occurs when one chooses to follow Jesus. Apart from Jesus, there's no interest in the things of God. Yet in Jesus, we see God's grandeur. Reconciled to God, no one can no, no, when one is reconciled to God, no one can no longer look at the people around them the way they once did. But we learn to see people as God does, valuing people as God does, because of their worth, because he created them in his image. This is the testimony of James. I no longer look at my brother the way I once did. When someone sees Jesus for who he is, or who, um, when someone sees Jesus for who he is, he or she doesn't look at the world the same way. He or she doesn't look at people the same way. Ask yourself, do you call Jesus Lord? James introduces himself as a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you introduce yourself or do you think of yourself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ? James moved from brother to servant. What have you moved from? Have you moved from rebel to servant? Atheist to servant? Indifferent to servant? Our worldly titles are secondary. They're tertiary. They're quaternary. What comes after that? I don't know. Look, you have to look it up. Worldly titles must follow who we are in Jesus Christ. Here's the takeaway. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that is your biggest deal. And mine. You may be a servant carpenter, a servant engineer, a servant painter, a servant teacher, a servant mom, a servant dad. But the best piece on your resume is that you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a servant of God, Savior, Messiah. Brandon, servant of Jesus Christ. Bailey, servant of Jesus Christ. Victor, servant of Jesus Christ. Hunter, servant of Jesus Christ. The Christian life is not mere theory. It is the life of a servant. Finally, after identifying himself and those he is writing to, James says, greetings. <clears throat> it could be translated, joy be to you. Yeah, joy. Even though you're scattered throughout the world among the nations, even though you face many trials, do not be robbed of your joy. German theologian Helmut Thelicke was asked what he saw as the greatest defect of American Christians. His answer? They have an inadequate view of suffering. Next week, we'll look at this joy in the midst of trials. It's the first major topic in the letter of James. Let's pray. Father God, you are good. We uh, glorify in you this morning and the beauty of your creation. We ask uh, your Holy Spirit to move within us, to make your word plain to us, to know um, how we need to live in light of your truths. Thank you for this day again. In Christ, amen.